Hi, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad you're joining us. I'm Chandel Hoover, APA Science Programs Officer, and this program is part of the APA series called Essential Science Conversations, where panelists and audience members can engage in an open dialogue about emerging topics in psychological science. Before we get started, I want to share a few quick announcements. First, many thanks to those of you who submitted questions for today's program when you registered. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. You can also ask a question as the program is taking place in real time. There's a Q&A feature on the dashboard. Please enter your questions there. We'll be monitoring those questions throughout the program. Also, this program is being recorded. So once it ends, everyone who registered will receive an email with a link to the recording in about seven to 10 days. So let's begin. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Minch Princeton's APA's Chief Science Officer. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Welcome to everybody from all around the world. I can see here in the chat. So glad to have you here to join us for this Essential Science Conversation. Today, we're going to be talking about research mentoring. Most of us who are researchers also are research mentors, but we um, rarely get any training on exactly how to become a research mentor. We're just expected to know how to do it when we start our positions uh, as mentors. And most of us might not be aware of the science of mentoring as well. I am so excited to introduce our panelists who will talk about the science of mentoring. And also we want to talk about the, sci the um, science around mentoring scholars of color. I'm really pleased to introduce our panelists for today's discussion. First, I'm excited to introduce Dr. June Gruber, who's an associate professor of psychology and neuroscience at the University of Colorado. She's also the director of the Positive Emotion and Psychopathology Lab. She was previously a faculty member at Yale. She is a UC Berkeley person through and through, receiving her PhD and her BA in psychology from Berkeley. Dr. Gruber teaches courses on topics including emotion and effective science, psychopathology, the science of happiness, and has created a free online course in human emotion available through YouTube. She has over 100 articles and chapters, edited two books that focus on mental health and positive emotion, and a focus on bipolar and related mood disorders. June is very invested in mentoring and in training. Um, she has received awards for her mentoring and teaching of students. She's very invested in supporting and in, uh, elevating the careers of underrepresented women in the sciences. She leads workshops, publishes papers, co-authors a column in science careers, and gives lots of talks to raise awareness about gender disparities in the field and to chart a proactive path forward. I'm also very excited to introduce Dr. Jesse Borelli, who is a professor of psych science and an associate director of clinical training at UC Irvine. She's also the clinical director of Compass Therapy, a private practice in Newport Beach. Um, Jesse received her PhD from Yale University and completed her postdoctoral internship at UCLA's Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. Her research focuses on the links between relationships and mental health across the lifespan. With Stacey Doan, she's the author of a parenting book called Nature Meets Nurture, Science-Based Strategies for Raising Resilient Kids, which is published through APA Press. She's very grateful for the mentorship she has received throughout her career, uh, Dr. Borelli says. Mentoring trainees at all stages of their careers is an aspect of the work that she says she enjoys the most. At the same time, mentoring can be challenging and humbling in an area of work that needs constant reflection and attention. And last but certainly not least, I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Mia Smith-Bynum, who is the Senior Director for Science, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the uh, American Psychological Association. Dr. Smith-Bynum's portfolio at APA addresses policies and strategies for ensuring that the research derived by the psychological sciences and the human talent that produces the scholarship represent the full breadth of humanity from all walks of life. Dr. Smith Bynum is also a professor of family science in the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland College Park. She was previously on the faculty at Purdue. She received her PhD in clinical psychology from UVA. She's the author of The Theory of Racial Socialization and Action for Black Families. She's also the co author of the Multi Dimensional Model of Racial Identity and the Multi Dimensional Inventory of Black Identity. Mia specializes in mentoring students from underrepresented groups and students seeking to enhance their technical knowledge for working with marginalized communities. 
When it comes to mentoring, she follows two key principles. One, pay it forward, and two, lift as you climb. She has received formal recognition for her mentorship over the years, but treasures most the nickname given to her by a former student, Research Mama. She thanks all the fantastic mentors she has had through the years. I am excited for us all together to have an essential science conversation. Welcome. Thank you all for turning on your cameras and joining us. It's so good to be with you here on this panel. You know, I wanted to start by just asking you, what did you feel prepared for? What did you already know about mentoring on the first day you were asked to mentor any student? What did you been taught or how how confident did you feel in your readiness to be serving as a mentor? Mitch, I think that's a great question. And it's one of the most complicated questions because in many ways we weren't taught anything concrete. Um, but yet I think, you know, we had some sense of what we liked in the mentors that we worked with, that they were supportive, that they had our best interests in mind, and that we learned and felt inspired for them. But those are very big qualities. They're very vague. So there's a feeling we had, but but maybe for myself, um, not a concrete sense of how do you become that and what does that look like? Thank you. Mia, Jesse, any thoughts? I'll, I'll say that when I was, had to think back of many years, um, but I'll start by saying I, I made mistakes uh, with my first students. Um, and so I think it's easier for me to talk about like the lessons that I took is, um, uh, cause one of the questions I know that is on our list is, is giving negative feedback. I think that you really have to be thoughtful with how you do that. And I made mistakes, um, with that early in my career, um, for minoritized students, they put you on a pedestal that you didn't know you had climbed up onto. Mm -hmm. And so when you say something, it can have a, a big impact. And so um, I learned that the hard way through some of the mistakes that I made and um, of, uh, learning to dial it back and to really prepare students for um, a negative feedback or critical feedback to help them grow. Um, and uh, um, I think too, um, I learned that mentoring sometimes mirrors the relationship that the trainee had um, with their mentors. And so, the closer, the more hands-on, the more involved, or the more distant um, that you um, uh, were with your uh, the people who trained you, then that can also um, be um, uh, the template that you draw upon. So it's a lot like parenting, I think, in that mm. way. Yeah, um, Mitch, I think that's a really great question. I, I would say, thinking back to the very beginning, I did not feel prepared at all to be a mentor. Um, I think I was terrified. As a new professor, I was I didn't feel very competent in my own skills, let alone my skills to mentor a student to do the work. So I I was scared that I didn't have um, much competence to share, uh, let alone to scaffold someone to to do this work that we were doing. Um, I did have a lot of reflections about my own experience being mentored, both in, in what had helped me grow and what had hindered me or what had not helped me or what I had wanted more of. And I think that's one of the biggest conclusions I think um, that I'd like to share with people here today is that I think being a really careful observer of your own experiences, both as a mentee and as a mentor, is probably one of the best gifts you can give your mentees. Um, so I do think that's something that helped me along the way is being really in tune with what with how I felt along the way. Thank you all so much for sharing that. I think I think lots of us feel, you know, not as well equipped as we are for other aspects of the job. And thanks for sharing your your experiences and vulnerabilities with that. I know that people are probably very um, appreciative of, of your candor. Um, June, I wanted to ask you, what do you think are some of the common myths that people have about mentoring? Yeah, I think there's some myths, and I think these myths make you, like Jesse was saying, feel kind of terrified when you're first stepping into the role, um, because at least we we tend to think that mentors should do and be everything, that they should be somehow 
um, you know, put on a pedestal and, you know, be idolized, that there are these figures, these almost like deities that, that we idolize, right, that they should be perfect. Um, I mean, second is that they need to be sort of all knowing, right, and that they should be able to answer all of our questions and point us in all the right directions. And, and I guess the third thing that makes this a very intimidating sort of image is that they need to somehow be transformative, right? And that somehow this single person, this mentor needs to do all these things. Um, and I think those are the myths that we have and the myths we carry, and they can lead us to feel like we're not doing enough. And I think they can lead our mentees to be disappointed and maybe for all of us to um, wonder, you know, what can a mentor do and um, what is, is, is not their role. So I think we need to have more open conversations about what mentors can really be for us rather than having them as these sort of mythical figures that no one person can be. June, you talk about kind of what is part of the mentor role, what is what might not be part of the mentor role. I guess for everybody, what are some of the, the descriptors of who you are to your mentees that are encapsulated in the very broad umbrella of the word mentor. Um, are you are you merely their research manuscript editor? It's more than that. What are some of the other titles that fall under that mentor heading? It's so much more, and that's the thing that's that's so powerful about it and humbling. I think, I think the biggest thing is that. Um, you know, that you are their advocate and ally, that you kind of have their back as they go through different things. And that could be writing a paper. It could be, you know, getting um, concerning feedback. It could be having an existential crisis about what they want to do with their lives and careers, but that you're there to support and advocate for them along the way. I think the other part is the, the relational part, right? You're not just sort of a a feedback mechanism where they give you a paper and you give it back with track changes or you write a letter for them for graduate school, um, but that you're a person that they feel comfortable talking to, a person that they feel supported with, um, a person that they have a relationship, that they know you as a human being. Um, so I think both of those being someone's ally and having a, a relationship with them, um, those are pieces that that we don't talk about when we talk about how to be a mentor. But at the end of the day, sometimes I think they're what makes students feel good or bad about their mentor, you know. And I think this is especially important for first generation students or underrepresented minority students who haven't had access to people in positions of power or people in higher education. Then you represent a whole other layer of importance, you know, you represent maybe a statement about their intelligence or worth in this context um, and provide really important, have the potential to provide important validating messages about whether they belong in this environment or whether they have potential to make a contribution to this environment. So you can create a safe space for students within this environment too. I'll say for first generation folks, uh, sometimes that might be a role that the mentor is serving that they may not be getting from family members who might not understand what are you doing and why are you doing this and what does it mean you do research all day does that mean you're on Google you know like and so the mentor is sometimes filling in for what one might not be getting from you know other folks in the same way that that uh, you know students might vary quite a bit. In, in where they're getting different sources of support or validation or, or kind of comfort. And a lot of that then falls on the mentor. Yeah. Mia, any thoughts? Yeah, I was, I was just thinking about that. Um, like sort of what you were pointing out is that to me, an effective mentor um, is also looking out for the student's well being. So it's not just the, the written feedback that you give or the professional um, guidance or direction um, that you give, but that. Uh, one of the things I'll note for um, uh, the whole academic life experience, um, and perhaps I'm jumping into the deep end of the pool, uh, Mitch, pull me back. <laughs> <That's think>. right. <laughs> um, but that our profession um, is so focused on individual accomplishment. Um, it's very competitive. And um, 
uh, uh, people who are in their role of faculty advisor may not always be a good faculty mentor because there are so many parts of the profession that incentivize behaviors that could be harmful to um, the students and protégés um, under our charge. And so, and then the students can feel that pressure and like, you know, oh, I'm, I'm dealing with my third bout of COVID, but I got to get my proposal written. Uh, uh, and my mama's sick and my daddy's sick and, you know, have to fly home and like all of that stuff, like, you know, and I'm being a little facetious here, but we have all, I think, seen students in crisis. Mm -hmm. And so reminding them that you can't learn if you're not feeling well emotionally, psychologically, physically, so on and so forth, and really helping to guide students through that, figuring out what they can take off of their plate, and then helping them to navigate whatever policy borders um, uh, come up when they're in crisis, um, or if they're just trying to figure out how to find their center um, as they move through a very competitive space. I agree. Yeah, I, oh, yeah please okay. go ahead. I agree okay. completely with that. And I think that's personally, I think that's one of the most important roles that mentors serve because we're seeing students when they're in a time of such heightened stress. Graduate school is, is, you know, in a lot of ways, like basic training, except it goes on for a very long period of time. And we're helping to give our students messages, really important socialization messages about the role of their own mental health and the prioritization of self-care in the midst of this context that in many ways is unhealthy. Um, and we can play a really powerful role in sending the messages that um, prioritize their sense of self and well-being. So I just want to echo what you're saying, Mia. <laughs> and I'm so glad that you mentioned that. Oh, sorry, June, go ahead. No, it's classic Zoom. Um, I was just going to say, just echoing the echo of, of Jesse and Mia, um, I think such a big part is both what we we do for our students to show them values and show them the importance of self-care and kind of whether we realize or like it or not, the way we're living our lives is serving as an image of the life that they may want or not want. I certainly, you know, remember looking at certain professors and thinking, could I be like them? Would I want to be like them? And, you know, just being very self-aware that the choices we make when it comes to you know, balancing our own work life if we have children and letting them know when that comes up and how we do it and, you know, just letting them them see because they're 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 watching and they're learning um, what a life can look like in this field. I think that the the points about balance and about modeling how to be balanced and take care of oneself professionally, but also personally are so, so important. And I think that they apply to folks across one's entire career. When it comes to mentoring, we're not always, but very often we're mentoring folks who might be in their 20s, let's say. What do we know from the literature about some of the developmental challenges, milestones, you know, experiences that might be happening in one's 20s that are probably going to make their way into your mentoring relationship or part of the discussions that would be good for mentors to know going in, this is probably going to end up being part of what you're talking about at some point. Anything you want to say about what we know about developmental emerging adulthood literature as it pertains to mentorship? Um, I think romantic partners and marriages, having babies. Um, I think we had a student in our department who um, had a baby in the middle of, um, and was already the mother of, of several children. I, I am a mere mortal. I couldn't have done it. Um, and one of the things I've learned when I see that is, is to, is to not advise people not to do it or, you know, about these choices in their personal lives, but to figure out how to support them. Um, uh, because they are taking what we say very, very seriously. And I learned that my own personal limitations are not an index of what a student may be capable of doing, um, given what family supports they may have and how determined uh, they may be. So what I do try to do for them is to map out realistically how they're gonna have to navigate that. And um, we, we just have honest conversations about that up front. I see a couple of questions in the chat about um, navigating visible and invisible disabilities and all of that. And I think, um, uh, having a conversation when you when the mentorship relationship commences, that you you say what your values are 
your vision for how you'd like to see the proteges develop and opening the door and being responsive when they're bringing these, these um, uh, personal matters forward. Because every, every student is different. Some uh, uh, manage these things differently. They're a little more private. But um, you're in a position of power. And I think that sometimes we forget that um, as, as faculty, like what, like what that means and, and, and how that, that may impact the student's comfort with disclosing what particular challenges that, that they have. Um, but uh, th that's my two cents on it anyway. Mm -hmm. Mia, I really appreciate you saying that because I think that was one of the biggest challenges I remember facing was being sort of unaware of the power dynamic, sort of, you know, we're all human beings, you know, let's just talk openly and assuming that that um, space would just happen organically. I think you're right that we have to find ways to help our mentees be comfortable. And this was a conversation that um, a student that I worked with, Sarah Haggerty, and some of our colleagues in biology talked about is, you know, how do we support clear communication? Because when our students can share what they're expecting, what their values are, and we can tell them where we're coming from, things can work a whole lot better than when those things are assumed or misunderstood. Um, so that was a lot of conversation we had about that, such a critical piece of things going well or not going well. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things we have spent a lot of time doing is um, really try to find ways to enhance the kind of transparency when you mentor. We've created these like written little lab agreements where I kind of sit down at the beginning of the semester with each of my students, whether it's undergraduate or graduate, and we kind of map out like, what are their goals? We map out kind of, you know, what do I think? Like, is that, should we, you know, change that timeline or should we do more or less? Like, and we kind of just talk openly and like by writing it down and having it almost like a syllabus for mentoring, like something that's there in the open, it doesn't bind you to it, but it it has certainly helped open the doors of like for students to feel the ambiguity of like, what is my mentor thinking? At least be assuaged. And at least for me to uh, worry less about, am I mind reading correctly of where my students are? And at least try to get a little bit more towards helping understand both ways. Cause I think it is that complication where you really want to understand where they're at, but sometimes it may be hard with the power dynamic for them to feel like they can share exactly what, what they want and need. Great points. Yeah, I, I think that um, for many folks, this might be their first job. They may have been a student for a very long time, first full-time kind of job for many. This is their first time being a teacher, in some cases, clinician, you know, managing finances, parents getting ill, roommate disputes. You know, there's so many things that are happening, sometimes with undergrads in particular, or with a post back in your lab. This might be the very first time they've had a full time job, and your mentoring is somewhat teaching them how to, how to handle workplace issues, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's so many things that fall under that hat of mentoring, right? Um, we're talking about development. I, it would, I feel remiss if not also asking about our own development as we age through the mentoring process. You know, I was 28 the first day of my first faculty job. My graduate students were my age or older than me, you know, and what I could say, how I said it, what I felt was I needed to project has been was very different when I started getting a few gray hairs and whatnot. So what's that experience like as, you know, how have you seen your mentor styles change or what's the feeling of starting off being a mentor when you might not feel very, you know, 10 minutes ago you were a postdoc and now you're a faculty member, like, and, and suddenly you have to be the mentor. What's that experience like? We're well, bringing back memories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll, I will say I um, I think I became more skilled as I went along, um, and then also just some personal life changes. Um, so um, in my faculty uh, second faculty position, I became a single mom, and uh, I see some questions in the chat about work family balance and setting boundaries with students and things of that nature. And even though I had studied black families and studied black single parent families boy, did I become much more humble when I became one. <laughs> and so 
that has probably more than any academic or professional credential uh, fueled my mentoring style. Um, because I knew um, as the only adult in my household that if mama goes down, everybody goes down, the whole system, like all of the things, dinner, you know, running errands, um, uh, taking my kid to sports practices and stuff like that. And so, and I realized I had to prioritize my own well-being if I was going to be able to do all the things expected of me. And so grace is probably the biggest thing <laughs> that I um, infuse into my work. I, I can tell because of the culture that we're in that students don't always believe me when I say it um, because they're getting different messages um, from other places. But that particular lifestyle change um, uh, has been huge and remains huge uh, for me. And um, uh, getting at some of the tensions that um, uh, I see here in the chat, like there's a question that says, um, I've ex I'm, I'm experiencing a lot of pressure as a junior faculty I want to uh, uh, look out for my, my students' well-being, but I feel so much pressure to produce. And I think the lesson from that is um, do what will make you feel comfortable looking in the mirror from day to day. Um, we love our work. We put our feet on the floor um, every morning if we're blessed to, that we go, get to go to work and do what we love. But when it comes to your students' well-being, your own ethics and values, um, keep that at the center. Um, and you will draw certain students to you because of how well you take care of them. Some of the questions we've been talking about is that climate. So for that post back that Mitch was mentioning, mentioning, if you've got good doctoral students who are fantastic academically and they're a great character, they're gonna help you take care of that post back. So creating that climate and you will attract the best of the best. And those students will often run to the ends of the earth for you. Um, if you have to go take a kid to a doctor's appointment, that's the student who will keep the lab meeting going when you step away. And so live out your values um, as opposed to the ones that the academy um, drives forward. And where you're supposed to be professionally is where you will land. Great. I think in answer to your question, Mitch, or did you want to switch? No, no I, I want you to keep okay. going. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I kind of brought this up in my intro. I think that in many ways, the beginning for me was the hardest because I doubted my own capabilities about mentoring. But I also think there was an advantage to being an early mentor because I really understood the graduate student experience. Like I was so close to it. I, I felt like I had more insight and empathy into what my graduate students were going into. Um, we're experiencing. And sometimes now I feel that I'm further away from it. There are parts that I forget almost about what the day-to-day -day life of a graduate student is like. It, it's it, I, I just a little bit more removed and I feel like that remove hurts me sometimes. And and I need, almost need my graduate students to remind me a little bit more about, no, wait, what, what are their lives like? Like, how, <laughs> you know, what is the day-to-day -day life like? It's easier to forget. Um, so I, there's a little bit of loss, even though now I feel like I'm much more skilled at setting limits um, on my own time with graduate students or certain things that were hard for me in the beginning, if that makes sense. That makes great sense. Let me let me ask, I'm looking at some of the questions that are coming in as well. I want to ask, let's talk about transparency. How much do you want to be transparent about your own experience? Um, the things that you're questioning, the struggles that you're dealing with, the things that that you're not sure about, and when do you not want to be? And how much do you want your mentees to, how much do you want to encourage transparency from them or not? June, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because I think one of the core values I have and I talk about with my students is is transparency. And we often talk about it in the context of like, you know, our working relationship and what they need and what's going well or what's not going well. And, you know, me um, giving them feedback, honest feedback about what's working. And, uh, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, being comfortable with sharing feedback if things aren't working. And that seems to be like a goal we all want to strive towards. I think the other layer though is like, how transparent do you want to be about your experience of the field, right? And like how you feel about everything, right? Are you um, 
you know, are you sometimes feeling like it's too much when you've got two young kids, we were just talking about this and, and they're sick and you're trying to balance that. And, you know, you feel like you're barely holding on some, some days to like just getting through the day, right. When you're trying to do it all. And I want to share that, but also like, don't want to overwhelm my students with, with the details of that. But I think they want to know those things. Um, the things sometimes I wonder more about, like, are these helpful and useful to students are some of the like, politics of academia, right? The stuff that happens in your department or the stuff stuff that happens in the field. Because on the one hand, you want them to see everything and and make a like an informed choice about what they want to do with their life and the field they want to go into. And at the same time, like I don't want to bog my students down. They have enough on their plate, like Jesse was saying, like our clinical students have a lot of courses, clients, research. Do they do they really want to hear the kind of like day-to-day -day drudgery that may happen politically, you know, in departments? And that's the part I sometimes hesitate on. Is it something they need to hear? Is, is it even appropriate for them to know that level, you know, of transparency? So I think the different layers make it complicated because you want to be open, but also have boundaries where, you know, you're letting them live their life and, and they don't need to know everything at every stage. And I find that a struggle. Um, sometimes because I want them to know things and be aware as they navigate their career. Other tips about transparency? I, I'm not sure exactly what the question was getting at, but I, but I love the question. And I think, I mean, there's, and I like the way June answered it too. I think there's also transparency in terms of, um, you know, what, your experience as a mentor is like in terms of working with your students. So for instance, sometimes there are certain students, at least for me, with for whom like I have a the experience of working with a student is quite frustrating. Like for example, reviewing draft after draft after draft, and I'll experience that the writing is not getting much improved, right? But I, you know, and I'll experience a lot of frustration with that and I'll give feedback and it won't get better. And um, we'll work on it. At what point do you share that the writing is not get, getting better? And do you share that you have frustration around it? For example, do you give, do you, is there transparency around that? Now, I would probably argue that you maybe don't share the frustration, but you do share that the writing is not improving, right? Because is the transparency around the frustration going to be helpful to the student? Or maybe you do at a certain point. Um, I don't know. I, I think that's kind of an interesting question. Like, do you, and it is, there, I think there's a parallel with parenting too, because in the parent child relationship, you wouldn't necessarily think that the child should take on the burden of your emotions. It's not their responsibility to take care of your emotions, but maybe the dynamic that's causing your emotions is something to take care of. Um, I don't know. Another well way. said. Yeah. Great. I want to talk for a moment about gender. Um, about 80% of graduate students in psychology right now are female. And there's still a disproportionate number of males. Um, I believe all of you identify as female, I identify as male. So let's talk about the difference in mentoring, if there's anything that one would do different when mentoring a male, female, or someone that identifies as non-binary. Let's talk about the differences maybe in how people are mentored if any are perceived by a male or a female. Um, and, and let's bring that to the fore, because I think that we need, because I'll just say, I think that um, we need to be champions and advocates for the experiences that those who identify as not male might experience in graduate school, given that it's a, a setting that has been dominated by a male system for so long. And so I, I don't think we can just bury our heads in the sand about this. I think we need to talk about the ways we want to be sensitive to those, uh, to gender kind of dynamics um, when we think about mentoring as well. Mia, any thoughts, any uh, reactions to that? I I think in my experience, because um, I've sort of known for someone who works with uh, um, students of color, first gen students, first gen students of color, um, and other marginalized groups. And I think um, I was also just known as mice, which is a double-edged sword <laughs> in academia because you get uh, to do lots of things sometimes without appropriate um, credit. And so I think bringing in that humility um, uh, to the process 
um, I think people are often just looking to be seen and to be heard. And so um, I like to bring up uh, um, the examples. I had two really wonderful white male mentors, um, uh, one during my assistant professorship and one um, when I was a doctoral student. And they both had two things in common that I really appreciated. Uh, they were very competent. Um, so at the top of their game professionally, I was lucky in that way. But they were also um, friendly and curious in an appropriate way. So one of the things you learn to do as a, as a person of color, a member of, an, of a marginalized group, I'll sort of plant seeds to sort of see, is this person ready for me to talk about the real, <laughs> the real experience of being a black person, a black woman in this white space. So I'll drop a breadcrumb and then I'll watch like a good psychologist, I'm observing behavior. And um, I'll say, well, yes, you know, like growing up black in, you know, X city and they'll be like, tell me more, right? And I think in both cases, they lean forward with a warmth that I felt was genuine and they put their hands on their chin, on their, their chin on their hands and said, tell me more. And so I know that they would not know all of what it meant, but the fact that I could pull down one more layer of the mask with them helped me to benefit from, from their uh, um, expertise and their guidance. And so um, as marginalized um, students and young professionals, um, we have to look for um, mentorships in multiple forms. And so sometimes uh, um, you can get fantastic technical mentorship from someone who is not a warm and fuzzy, but a, a cold fish, right? They're, they're very technical. But, um, and when students don't feel that warmth, um, they sometimes will mistake that as someone that they can't do business with. And I always ask them, do they give you equivalent opportunities uh, um, as to those for the majority of students in on that team, you know, pick an identity. Um, are they spending as much time? Are you getting plum assignments? Are they helping you grow with that critical feedback? And so if the answer is yes, yes, and yes, stay with that cold fish and get your warm and fuzzy somewhere else, right? That might be from mama, that may be from a faculty member across campus, um, or or city, right? Um, because you can do this digitally now. So so really assessing the content of the feedback and shaking it off, you know, because it can sometimes sting, but then knowing that if I could stay in here and I'm not being mistreated, I'm just not getting the warm fuzzies. I can, I can, I can make it. Um, particularly when that training is very hard to get, is very specialized. I mean, there's just not a lot of places to get it. I think Thank you for that, Jesse. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, um, I really focus a lot on trying to address what I perceive to be one of the biggest barriers for women continuing in academia or science related careers, which is not seeing a place for having a family within that career. And so I try to make space for my female students to talk about um, their, you know, the way that they see family as part of their life and part of their career. Um, I think this is even more of an issue for students of color or first generation students. Um, but I think it's actually an issue for all female students that they don't see this as a career that's welcoming or inclusive of their entire family. And I, that was also the case for me. And I had a time in my life where I decided I wasn't going to be an academic because I was married to someone who was going to be in one location. So I gave up the idea of being an academic. Um, and it was only because I happened to find a job in one place that it worked out for me. Otherwise, I would have gone the other path. And so I always make time with my students, with all of them, also with male students, but especially with female students to talk about how does this fit into your overall life plan to plans of if you want to have a partner, you want to have a family, you want to have kids, you want to have, is this going to be a good match for you? And how can you think about incorporating that? I, Jesse, I completely agree with that point too. And I think, as you said, I also had my doubts about being able to, um, you know, start a family and have it work out with my partner. And so, you know, a lot of these issues in academia, and we have two body issues if our partners and academic are real. And so part of me tries to like support them through, you know, if it's, if it's a partner complication or they're thinking about starting a family, how's that going to work? Um, I both try to like share experiences of, of my own, like this is how it has worked for me. And 
and contrast that with some of my close friends who are not academics and what's it really like to have young children in a job like this where there are high demands but a great degree of flexibility compared to other kinds of careers and um, where there may be a more kind of clear-cut nine to five and, and the pros and cons of all jobs and to sort of think about what might work for them. Um, I think also the thing I try to spend a lot of time on, and I know Jesse's similar with this too, this kind of, you know, we sort of brought nearly like 60 women together in our field and and wrote a paper together a couple of years ago now, um, really sort of, um, you know, pulling the blinds away from psychological science and saying like, where where are issues of gender disparity in our field? And being able to talk about those with my trainees, but also talk about it in a way that um, motivates us to make it better and, and stay in this field. Um, I think that's something I try to do too, is be honest about the limitations and about the challenges while saying, but we, we can but we can make it better. Um, and we have so much capability as psychological scientists who study gender and discrimination, who study behavioral change. Um, if anyone can make it better, we at least ought to try. So I think it's that balance, right? Of like it being honest about the field and about challenges for especially females. Um, and also what can we do at a big picture level? And um, showing them if they want it, um, what can it look like to have a family um, in this kind of career and just showing them like, what's a day-to-day -day life like, like actually like, seeing it because I think otherwise it can feel impossible. And I felt that way too, as a grad student, I don't see how anyone can make this work. And it's hard to know until you have people that can just share what they've done and what's worked and what's been hard. Thank you all. Um, okay. So let's say your mentee has done something not to your satisfaction you need to deliver some critical feedback this is something that every mentor feels a bit more scared about this kind of an interaction than other interactions dare i say that this is probably something where every mentor has had times they feel that they've done it well and times they feel like that didn't go so well um what tips do you have uh, things to do, things to avoid when you have to deliver negative feedback to a mentee. I would say that the first foundation is they have to trust you, um, right? So um, there's that power differential there and they're, they're being vulnerable whenever they submit something to you or, or some, someone else uh, in the program. And so if they trust you, it makes that conversation um, a bit more, a bit easier because I'm I'm relying on that trust factor uh, to help scaffold um, that negative feedback. And um, the other thing that I will often do, and I think this is really important for first gen students and um, students of color who are trying to understand a Western norms of individual accomplishment, is you got to sort of translate. Uh, the cultural norms that they're that may be from their background versus um, like what it takes to be in this profession. And so um, so I often will tell my students um, uh, getting a PhD, if that is the, the focal degree, getting a PhD is not easy. A lot of other people would have it. And I, I basically tell them um, the air is thin. This is not a nurturing experience. <laughs> so so, you know, with that understanding, um, I always try to mentor my students so you can go toe to toe with any scientist that might question your credentials. And in that way, I'm equipping them uh, to perform in a way that they can go into any professional space. And so I'm almost like preparing them for battle. And so that's just infused in how I focus my work with my students. And so then I lay out, this is what you gotta do, you gotta hear there. And usually if they trust you, they're like, oh, darn, that was rough. But they'll go back, you know. But if they if they don't trust you or if they're dealing with some deep imposter syndrome or some other things, you got to kind of start to pull, pull that apart a little bit more. And um, depending on what the circumstances are, um, it may be a bigger issue. But if it's just one interaction, that's sort of um, uh, my, my strategy. 
I love those examples, Mia. I think that's really good inoculation <laughs> against that. I can tell you some mistakes uh, that I made. I, I've also, I, I think the best that I've done is delivering really direct feedback. I think when I do it directly, it has the most success. Um, the biggest mistake I've made is when I've delivered feedback um, in a way that I think was less direct, or at least that the student didn't experience it directly enough. And then at, in another situation delivered it with another colleague present and the student perceived that as really the first time they they received the feedback i don't know if that's clear but like meaning i it has to come i think first in their interaction with you and i think this goes back to what mia was saying your trust their trusted person um in a more private environment so that they hear it from you before it before they hear it and like for example a defense or something like that um that's more optimal um and if i think my tendency is to deliver to deliver it too softly and then if they hear me deliver it in front of someone else um that's not a good um, way to do it yeah jesse i i resonate with that both um if it's delivered too softly or a little bit too roundabout um a message can get lost and then um, it can be hard to then be direct and that can seem maybe aversive or, you know, I once had to deliver feedback on behalf of a program and that can make them feel betrayed because it's like other people were part of this conversation. I guess the, the lessons I've learned is, um, to try to aspire towards, you know, reminding them like, you know, as your mentor, like I'm your advocate. I'm your ally. And part of my job, if I'm going to do my job is to give you all kinds of feedback, you know, and to just try to be as matter of fact about it so that it can feel like, like less high stakes. And it's just, you're kind of just telling them the way things are. And then, um, so what can we do? Like, here's the stuff, you know, here's the things to work on. So let's make some goals around it. And as simple as the message can be, I think it can feel less threatening and more matter of fact, but, but that can be, it's, it's not easy to do, either, you know, at the same time. Yeah. Can I, I say an appointment, a point about that? Cause June really made a, a good point that I use that one of the things that to share, cause sometimes what will happen is someone else gave my student negative feedback and they're coming to process it with me. I'm sure we all have had that conversation and I tell them, in this environment, feedback is an investment in you. When people say you're great, you walk on water, that's actually um, a slap in the face. But you don't always know that if you were the straight A student in your undergraduate program and you, you did walk on water at that place. But uh, feedback is an investment. So if they've taken the time, so do you know how long it took them to go through this document? So you know it took four, four hours, right? With all the line edits. I'm like, for real? It's like, yes, a half a day. So if they sat down, they see your potential and mm. you, the way you, you respond is you go back and you take this feedback and you give them something fabulous and I'll help you. Right. The other thing too, that, um, this tentative feedback too, that I want to um, mistake, uh, make sure that I say a mistake I see white faculty do way too often is confuse, uh, um, a, a negative evaluation of a student with racism. Right. And so uh, uh, white faculty, like, and this, this, and this is what racial stereotypes have done to our country. Is you know we have horrible stereotypes about people of color, um, in and in their intellect, right? Uh, with the exception of the model minority uh, that is aimed at Asian Americans, and the research shows that that compromises them as well. Mm -hmm. And so, when you read a piece of work by a student, you make your honest assessment, and then, um, uh. You, you do it compassionately, but you're direct. And again, it's that trust piece. If you're not sure that the student trusts you, that's sometimes where, where the gap comes in. And this is where uh, doing some more of your own reading, consulting with a trusted colleague, this is why we need racially, ethnically, um, and gender diverse networks. So we're not always having to rely on people who look just like us and have had some of the same life experiences. Um, and, uh, uh, Get, and even on the risk of having a student get angry, still telling the truth, because that usually bears out when someone else reads the work anyway. And then reminding them, if you send this out and it, it is not successful in this arena, 
how is that going to come back on you as, as the student? And you, you walk them through that logic and they're like, oh, yeah. And I was like, I said, that's not going to be good. And you care about this work, don't you? Yeah, I do. Right. And so that's that's the piece in terms of um, critical feedback is not racist. <laughs> it's honest. <laughs> and so let's just erase that. Can you? My, one of my soapboxes. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Um, what do we know about uh, a lot of what you're talking about fits with some of the science of mentoring. There's not as much science on mentoring as there should be, particularly when it comes to mentoring psychology students or around tasks unique to our discipline. But nevertheless, um, you know, what does the science say I, about pretty clear to do's and, and to not do's? June, do you want to start us off on that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that first came to mind that the science talks about, but then we don't really speak much about in practice, um, are the benefits of multiple mentors. Um, I feel like especially in clinical psychology, the way we even apply to graduate school is with a single person that's going to be our sole go-to mentor. At least that's what we're supposed to believe. Um, but we know that the science says that what really helps us learn is having many different kinds of mentors who give us diverse perspectives, different skill sets, um, you know, fill different needs we have. Maybe, you know, the more technical side of things, we need someone with more career, professional development, et cetera. And I think we could do a better job following the science, both in terms of how we um, explain this to our students and in terms of how we set up their training experiences that indeed they they should have in their in their plan and their expectations who are going to be the different people that are going to mentor them that that semester even you know class instructors are a form of mentorship too clinical supervisors um i i think we could certainly improve and really like disseminating that and making that um really more of lived experience because it works I can add a little bit to this conversation. Some of this we've already been talking about here, so this won't come out mm -hmm. as new information, but the, what the research shows is that mentees need their mentors to provide them with different forms of mentorship. So not just career or academic related support, but also the kind of so psychosocial support that we've been talking about here. And so, um, you know, many of us have already given you this message, but if you see mentors in your department or we know of people who would just view their role very narrowly defined as I'm just here to mentor my students in how to be a psychological scientist just to do the work, that's really not what mentees benefit most from. They really do mentor benefit from a, a more well-rounded approach that takes into account their mental health and psychosocial needs. That's, that's really the best approach. And within that, they also value things like how you um, model your role as an academic, um, communicating very effectively about your boundaries, things like not rescheduling meetings a lot, that's very stressful for students, and giving this honest and constructive um, communication and feedback, some of what we are already been talking about. I want to mention, um, first of all, how much the advice and the um, experiences that you've had has been so incredibly valuable. And I and I know from things that I'm seeing pop up in the chat and whatnot that that uh, folks are very appreciative. In fact, there are so many great questions. We may need a part two because there's so many great things to talk about here. Um, for some information, I know that there um, was a paper on mentoring uh, in psychology that appeared in what was then referred to as the Journal of Abnormal Psychology, and we'll post that link to that article alongside this uh, recording at the APA Essential Science Conversations website. I also wanted to say just to tag onto the points that some of you made about so many of the different roles that you have to play. It was my own personal experience. Thank you so much, Chandel, for posting that in the chat. Um, of In academia, of trying to balance many of those roles by consistently talking with students about the different hats I felt I was wearing in that moment and just making them incredibly explicit and saying, you know, there's a part of me that as the PI of this grant that we need to collect the data on really soon. I, I wanted to have a conversation with you about how we can make sure we get, you know, moving on this job. And then the part of me that is your mentor really is concerned about if you're okay and how can I help you? And this is a really stressful time. And I want to put both of those on the table and, and let's talk about how we can find a way to, you know, help move both of these forward. Because I, I, at least when starting, found that if I didn't make that very explicit, 
what came out was a mishmash that was helpful to nobody. So it was really helpful to try and be as clear about the multiple hats we wear as often as possible, right? Um, and I'm taking that away from what you're all saying today too, because we do have so many hats and it is hard and we don't know how to do that when we get started. Well, that's um, something we talked please. about it's called role sharing and that's something that's very challenging for mentors is that we do play all these different roles but one of the things that's really also in line with what the research shows is that being really reflective about yourself in all these different capacities helps to make you a better mentor sorry I cut you off no that's great that's great I want to say thank you so much to you all for participating today and for being so open and candid in, in sharing your experiences and your thoughts. For everyone listening, um, you may have heard about this series through the free newsletter uh, called Science Spotlight. Um, Science Spotlight is where we are constantly giving away money and more opportunities you know, for free. You don't have to be an APA member to subscribe or for most everything that we talk about in there. If you are not subscribed, you may be missing out. So check out the chat or simply Google APA Science Spotlight and subscribe. Um, please tell other folks who may not have the opportunity uh, to have taken this hour out about that as well. So they don't miss out on some of the um, scholarships and other kinds of experiences that we're offering. We wanna make sure those are freely available to everyone. Drs. Gruber, Borelli, uh, Smith Bynum, I wanna thank you so much for your participation. I wanna thank Shandel Hoover and other members of the APA staff for all of the work that it takes to make this come across so seamlessly and expertly. Thank you so much for that. I hope everyone enjoyed our conversation and might take just one minute to fill out a, um, a survey that you'll get afterwards to tell us about what we're doing well and what we can do to be more useful to you throughout your scientific career. You can also email us at science at apa.org with any feedback. I look over all of those myself, so I'd be very excited to get your feedback too. Um, and I want to thank everybody for their time. Have a great uh, rest of your day.